Um, if you remember last week, we ended up um, speaking on how Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar had really taken control of the area again away from the Assyrians. And this, this happened around um, uh, 600, 605 B.C. So n now we get into this again right around 605 B.C., um, the book of Daniel, and one of the greatest prophecies um, that the Bible has. And as, if you remember last week's class, we talked about how God wanted to reveal himself to the nations. And there were two ways we focused on. One was Israel, the nation of Israel being a witness to God and his glory, and the other through prophecy. And we had a, statements from uh, biblical scholars that said, you know, if you can honestly read these prophecies and think of them as histories, uh, you know, that's not what the Bible is. The Bible can predict the future. And we looked at a few last week, and we're going to pick that up this week by quickly looking at uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the image in Daniel chapter 2 and what it represents. Um, so again, right around 605 B.C. is probably the time frame when Daniel and his friends were, were taken captive into Babylon. And then we're told in chapter 2 that in Nebuchadnezzar's second year, uh, which was probably Daniel's third year in Babylon, he had this dream. And, it, it, and many of us know the story that Nebuchadnezzar's magicians, astrologers could not interpret it. Um, but Daniel, through divine intervention of God, is able to interpret it. And the meaning of the dream uh, as we look at the, the image that's up on the screen, you know, the head of gold, the breast of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and of course the feet of iron and clay. Um, and uh, the head of gold, as we know, was represented of Babylon. And uh, I, I can just think, knowing Nebuchadnezzar, the way how the Bible describes him, is when Daniel said, Thou king art the, art the head of gold. And any man's reaction. I remember when my basketball coach once told me, Mark, you're the best player on my team. And I was like, ooh, you know, and you, you get all puffed up, you know, you're happy and excited, and you, you, you get a little egotistic. And what we know from Nebuchadnezzar in a verse we'll look at in a little bit, I'm sure his head really, he really got puffed up. Very proud, proudful man, arrogant. Um, so this probably puffed him up until Daniel got into the other interpretations of the image. Um, so w we see that, you know, gold was a very fitting symbol of Babylon. Um, Isaiah 13, 19, and we won't look it up, but describes Babylon as the glory of kingdoms. In Isaiah 14 and 4, it's a, Babylon is described as the golden city, and it was the currency of Babylon. So we know throughout Scripture when we read details of places, how, how words and phrases just aren't put in there randomly. Um, you know, in Revelation, when, when, when Jesus is talking about, um, oh, I'm probably going to get it wrong, but uh, one of the descriptions he uses for one of the ecclesias um, is, he, he uses it, um, descriptions, let's see if I can find it real quick. I think it's in chapter 2. Yeah, the Laodiceans, where Jesus says, I know thy works, uh, thou art hot, and thou art lukewarm, uh, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Uh, knowest thou that thou art wretched? And he says, buy of me fine gold tried in the fire, and thou mayest be clothed at the shame of thy nakedness. So in his description here, he uses words that the people would understand. And it's the same here with this description of the image of Babylon being the gold, because that's how they thought of themselves. That's how they were. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, history tells us, was a very competent general. Um, and he had one of the most magnificent empires the world has, has ever seen. Um, he takes over, just begins to take over Judah in around 605. And of course, we know in 586, that Jerusalem was flattened uh, by his armies. Um, in chapter 3, verse 1, upon hearing this great news that he is this, this head of gold, 
we read the following about Nebuchadnezzar. What does he do? Uh, instead of being humbled by the image, he goes out and he makes himself an image of gold for people to bow down to. Again, the arrogance and the pride of this man. And in Daniel 4, verse 30, uh, we read these words which uh, really tell the story of how Nebuchadnezzar was. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? All right, Nothing was done for the glory of God. It was all done for his own glory. Uh, something that, it, that has been passed down since Nimrod, the beginning of time with, with mankind. In Isaiah 13, 19, uh, Isaiah declares the fall of Babylon some 100 years before it actually takes place. Um, so the Babylon, the head of that, the gold, and, and we're going to get into a little bit the significance of Babylon being the head. After that, we get the breast of silver, which would represent the Medes and Persians who would, who would conquer the Babylonians. Um, in Daniel 7, I didn't mention this with, with um, Babylon, but if you remember in Daniel 7, when Daniel has his image of the beast, uh, Babylon is represented by the lion, and uh, the Medes and Persians would be represented by the bear. Um, the two arms of this dual-natured kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Um, it's an inferior kingdom, thus the silver. Again, nothing is just put in there randomly in the Bible. There's a meaning to it. Um, it was an inferior empire to the Babylonian Empire when it comes to luxury and magnificent, but it outlasted the Babylonian Empire, so it had length of days. Um, taxes and tribute were paid in this empire using silver. So again, nothing's random in Scripture. It's there for a reason. And then we get to the thighs of brass, which represents Greece, the leopard of Daniel 7. Uh, Alexander the Great breaks the power of the, the Medes and the Persians. Um, they were noted for their brass, their copper, and they used it for armor. Their warriors used it for armor. Uh, I thought this, I put this in here just because I thought it was very ironic because we know what Babylon represents in Scripture, the lust of the flesh and the pride of the eyes, and we're told that Alexander the Great dies at a young age while, while, while drinking in Babylon. Um, kind of appropriate. Uh, and of course his empire ends up being divided by his four generals who instead of uniting uh, go against each other and, and things start to break up. And then of course the legs of iron. And in Daniel 7.7, 7, and I do want to read this for you because in, in his image Daniel makes special note of this last um, image of his. This is what Daniel says of, of this beast that he sees, which represents um, the Roman Empire. He sees in the night a vision before a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. So this beast was different. Uh, this beast was dreadful to Daniel. Um, and what was it about the Roman Empire? That, and iron again, um, the Bible is so consistent because it, it, it broke in pieces and they subdued everything in their path. Uh, they extended an empire which reached out um, a lot further than most of these other empires. Uh, they were ruthless in how they conquered each other. Brother Jim Sullivan brought up to me uh, last week how the Assyrians, about their ruthlessness, and the things that they would do to those they captured, the brutality. And, and Rome was the same way. You think of Romans, one thing they did do on a positive sense was to create roads so they could move their forces around the conquered territories. Uh, aqueducts and roads, they were famous for that stuff. Um, as, as you can see, the empire, um, at the death of Augustus Caesar, the empire covered an area a hundred times greater than the original size. And they were never conquered. And I thought this was an amazing fact because I think of the world today and one thing, you know, a, a lot of people in America 
don't think America will be, will be conquered by a foreign force, but they will, they will break up from within. And that's what happened to the Roman Empire. They deteriorated from within. And a lot of people see that happening to the United States. If you look at politics and everything going on in the country today, you know, there's a lot of, if you listen to some channels, talk of possible civil war. You know, there's such disagreement and mistrust um, that this country, they feel, is deteriorating from within itself. So that's what happened to Rome. And they became ten major tribes corresponding to the ten toes. But there was iron that continued uh, flowing through uh, the clay. And that was the continued influence of something Roman that would continue to this day, and that would be uh, Papal Rome, Catholicism. And the future role that that will have um, when it comes to the time when, when Christ will gather the nations together. So, so what does this image represent? If someone were to ask you, what does the image represent, besides doing what I just did and going through all four of, of the metallic substances that make it up, what would we say it represents? Well, we, there are de definitely four different empires are mentioned. And even though these empires were different, um, they had one thought, one thing that permeated throughout all of them. And it's the same thing that permeates today through the kingdoms of men. All right? So when we think of ourselves, brothers and sisters, you know, we think of ourselves, we are the body of Christ, right? With Jesus as the head. And what do you think of when you think of the body of Christ? What, what are the thoughts that come from, from our head, Jesus, that should permeate through our body? Love, mercy, forgiveness, right? And I'm sure you can think of, of many others, all right? So that permeates down from our head, Jesus, down to the rest of us, okay? Well, it's the same thing with this body of metal that Daniel tells us about. There's a thought that permeates down through this image as well, through all these years of history, actually starting with Nimrod. I mean, it's the same thought that permeates through that, that thought and image. So if you will, if you're inclined, let's go back to our very first class when we we talked about God's dominion mandate, okay? And I want to read this to you, and, and maybe you can think of something that it doesn't say, okay? So we're back in Genesis 1.26. And God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay, this dominion mandate that, that God gave to mankind. Um, and how is this going to be accomplished? And we've already gone over this. God gave man mental superiority over the, the, the animal world, over all the creeping things and the fish. And God also gave man his character. God was going to be the guide to man overspreading the earth, spreading God's glory, and having dominion. Okay? It was all under God's control. But what doesn't verse 26 say that man should have dominion over? And that answer is man himself. Now I can read it again, but I don't see in there that it says man should have dominion over his fellow man. It's not there. No mention of it at all. So there are cases where God declares where man should have dominion, a father over his household. Um, the kings over Israel were, were to have dominion. And there are times with God, at God's command, man has, you, you might say, well, what about Joshua and David when they were conquering? Well, that was under God's command. Okay, God was in control of that situation, telling man to do that. So here in Genesis, there is no mention at all at the beginning of man having dominion over his fellow man. It wasn't meant to be that way. Um, and, and man did it upon himself to do so. And how did they do that? Well, the obvious one is strength. I mean, you go back to Nimrod and you, the mighty hunter. You know, strength. I'm superior to you. Uh, Cain and Abel. You know, Cain kills Abel. 
So, you know, the, the, the thought there is that he had superior strength. And mankind uses that strength over its fellow man to dominate. Um, you know, if you think of your high school years, there were, there, were, there were people, there were guys that tried to intimidate you with their physical strength. Uh, I ran into that one or two times myself, uh, where someone would try to intimidate me and, and dominate me, make me fear them with their physical strength. And there's another way man does it too, and it's also mental. It's a mental, um, you know, persuading you to think the things that you, you hold is true really aren't true, and that I'm going to tell you what truth is. Okay? You know, a lot of people say the government is that way with us. That they will tell us what they want us to know, what they want us to learn, and what they want us to do. Um, some people out there, those with COVID, you know, the lockdowns and all that, a lot of people will say government conspiracy, they're just trying to control us and have us do their will and not to think for ourselves. All right, that happens to believe the lie. You know, what you really, th you, you might have seen that, but that's not really what happened. All right, that's a control that, that men, nations use over their subject. And you see it throughout the world. I mean, Hitler and some of the great leaders, the control, amazing that what they had over their people so that they believed in what their leaders were doing was right, the right thing to do. So this is something that permeated from the head, all right? From Nimrod right through Babylon right through today. It still permeates um, through the head of this statue, and our views are, are our head is Jesus, and ours are totally different. And that can be a, a tough situation for us to live in, a world like this, where a wor the world has one set of thoughts and ideas, and, and we have a totally different set of thoughts and ideas. Any questions or comments on that? Does it make sense? Ben's shaking yes, so I feel good about that. Thanks, Ben. All right. So, of course, if you read the prophecy further, we know that there will be a stone cut out of a mountain, okay? And that stone, of course, Christ refers to himself as the stone in Matthew 21, 44. And that this mountain, uh, which is symbolic of nations and powers, um, as you can see, the statue will be struck by the stone and the stone will crumble, uh, never to become again when the kingdom of God is established upon the earth. And, of course, we, we read the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, signifying that Christ was the work of God and not the, the work of mankind. So... The image will be destroyed, and this is the day we wait for, brothers and sisters, the day that Revelation speaks of when God gathers the nations. Then finally, when this image is destroyed, prophesied so long ago, I mean, 2,600 years now. 2,600 years. All right? So a little bit more prophecy. You know, everything's being prepared. We mentioned in our first classes the importance and the comfort we get out of knowing that God's in control of everything that's going on, okay? And the nations of the world are being prepared right now for the return of Christ. Uh, and if we look, one thing in Revelation 16, a key event, and I don't want to get into it too much. Brother Butch, in one of his classes a while ago, uh, covered this so well. Uh, Revelation 16 is the sixth vial of, of judgment that will be poured out. And in verse 12, uh, we read that the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up. Now, you can't see on this map, but the river Euphrates flowed up into, into the lands of the Ottoman Empire, or the Turkish Empire. And we mentioned in previous classes, and that this drying up of rivers means that a country or a nation or a kingdom is going to lose their power. They're going, to, they're going to weaken. And that's what this prophecy tells us about. It tells us about the Ottoman Empire. And it speaks of this drying up of the river Euphrates. And the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And we think of the Ottoman Empire, the drying up of the river, 
Um, you know, there's some examples uh, we didn't look at. We looked at the one of Egypt, but the Assyrian strength in Isaiah 8 speaks of the overflowing of rivers of, of Syria coming down into the land and, and taking uh, hold of the northern kingdom. So verse 12 speaks of the way of the kings uh, might be prepared, and, and this needed to happen, didn't it, so that the Jews could start coming back into the land. This Turkish forces that were occupying had to be pushed out, and God's hand was huge in this. Uh, uh, forces of, of Britain and other nations pushed the Turks back up to the north, and this opened the door uh, for Israel to come back into the land and to fill, fulfill what was prophesied in Ezekiel 38. And I want to look that verse up. Uh, Ezekiel 38, verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited, and in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So this regathering all over Scripture, we, it, you know, we know the verses, where it speaks of Israel being regathered. And for that to happen, this Turkish Ottoman Empire had to be, had to be weakened so that Israel could return to the land. Uh, and that, as we know, in 1948, the state of Israel was born, and here are some other verses. We won't look them up just because of time, but that speak to the rebirth of Israel that needed to happen before the return of Christ. Um, other ways in which you know, the nations are being prepared um, for the return of Christ. You know, uh, Matthew 24, and another verse I want to look up if we can. You know, the, 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 the fear that mankind, and you can sense that, can't you? If you speak to people, I speak to coworkers, and, and there's a lot of fear of not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring. Uh, whether we're going to go to war with Russia, um, there's a lot of it. There's a lot, you know, the economy, um, you know, COVID, uh, are the strains coming? There's a lot of fear, a lot of people, you know, we see mental health issues really on the rise over the last five to ten years. I mean, it's sad what's happening to a lot of, and you may have friends and people you know that it's happening to. It, it's really sad. Uh, but, but these things have been prophesied in Scripture to us. Um, you know, I think of, I think it's in Matthew where, you know, where Jesus said it'll be like the days of Noah, uh, the world, and, and we see it really that way. And I remember a class brother Steve gave um, on this same topic, and he said, Mark, it really hasn't changed since after the flood, it's, it's just been different degrees of it, but you know, men's hearts failing them for fear. And, and we see that uh, in our daily lives, maybe. Many of you have seen that. Uh, I know I have, talking to some people. Um, I have, I've probably told you this story before. I have one female coworker that says God should just blow up the world and start over. That's, that's what she thinks about everything, how, how a failure mankind is. And, you know, I try to tell her, I said, well, I can show you some scripture in the Bible that says that's not going to happen, and God has a plan for the earth. But she just doesn't see it. She just doesn't think it's going to happen. Um, political chaos, and, you know, we don't, you know, want to get into that. I'm just thankful that I don't vote, that we don't vote, that God is the ruler of the kingdoms of men, and we leave it in his hand. I mean, nothing for nothing, but, you know, if I was a citizen, if I didn't know the truth, I would hate to be voting in these elections with the, with the people that are sent, sent out there to, to guide the nation. I really would. Um, but we know it's all under God's control, and he'll put in there whom he deems right at the time. So, and that's all over the world, isn't it? We see governments uh, trampling down their people, phony elections where one guy... Well, in the Soviet Union, that, that gentleman, I forget his name, uh, who just died in prison, who was suppressed because he went up against, he was against Putin. Um, and that's not just in Russia, it's, it's nations all over the world. Um, Butch covered this in one of his classes. He looked at Joel chapter 3. And I do want to go to some of these verses as, as we're looking at this time where, where the nations are being prepared uh, 
for the return of, uh, of, of Jesus in Joel chapter 3. So we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. Um, is that what I want? Yeah. In, in verse 4, it says, Yea, what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine? And Brother Butch mentioned that these references of prophecy were possibly concerning Hezbollah and Hamas and their attacks on Israel that we've witnessed. Okay? Uh, these things coming to life. In Joel 3, verse 9, uh, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. And, and that's happening now in Ukraine, isn't it? You know, farmers, everyday farmers are trading in their, their, their plows and their, their full weapons of war to fight off Russia. So we're seeing that. We're seeing prophecy playing out in front of our eyes with, with this battle in Ukraine. And this is just the beginning. As Russia starts to rise to prominence, uh, we know at some point they will unite with Europe, uh, with Papal Rome, and they will move into the Middle East and into Egypt um, and to seek a spoil. That's to come. So I found, as I, as I was um, preparing, a, a Christadelphian video. And this was a video, um, Brother Matt Davies, and I'm sorry I didn't write down his ecclesia, uh, presented. And I, it was fascinating. He does a wonderful job. And um, I, I, I took a couple of snippets from it because I thought it was important. People have asked, you know, why, how do you, why Russia? Why is it going to be Russia? What's, you know, b beyond the Bible, what, what else is there going on that we know it's Russia? And, and what you have before you, and I, I got in the smaller insert um, the map of nations, and you could see in the small insert, uh, Gog, Magog, and, and so on and so forth. But the bigger map shows before 1991, a map of NATO, the North Atlantic um, countries, and the Soviet Union. And you can see in the middle there's, there's an area called the Eastern Bloc. And these areas were kind of like a buffer between NATO and Russia. Uh, they tended to lean toward the Soviet Union uh, I, I'd call them satellites, but they were dependent on the Soviet Union, but they were not at that time part of the Soviet Union. So this is what it was like in 1990, before 1991. And if you remember your history, what happened in 1991? Anyone remember? I know that's a long time ago. Jim? Yeah, yeah, communism fell, the Soviet Union broke up. And what has been happening ever since is, well, before we get to that map, this is a quote I got off of uh, one of our brother's slides from Vladimir Putin. Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are all descendants of ancient Rus. And this is an ancient, ancient ter named territory um, that if you look at the map, the small insert, Mago, Go, those areas were considered uh, the land of Rus, R-U-S. Um, the largest state in Europe, Putin. I am confident that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. Our spiritual, human, and civiliza civilizational ties form for centuries and have their origins in the same sources. They have been hardened by common trials and achievements and victories. Our kinship has been transmitted from generation to generation. It is in the hearts and the memory of people living in modern Russia and Ukraine in the blood ties that unite millions of our families. Together we have always been and will be many times stronger and more successful, for we are one people. All right? That's why he's going into Ukraine. If you look at this map, the second map, that eastern bloc that was once under Russian control, and you've, you've heard it on the news how NATO wants all these nations to join them. Uh, Poland, you can see some of the others, and there's Ukraine uh, right in the middle of it. And from what I read, and I don't read a lot on this politically, but there, there were comments made to Vladimir Putin, you know, 
hey, this is it. We're not going to try to infringe any closer to you. You know, we're not going after Ukraine for NATO. We're not going after Belarus for NATO or any of these others. But from what I know, th there have been talks to try to make Ukraine part of NATO. Okay? And that got to put a big fear in, into the Soviet Union and into Vladimir Putin, considering what he just said. So this is Vladimir Putin's views on the collapse of the Soviet Union back in 1991. We should acknowledge that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a major geopolitical disaster of the century. For the Russian nation, it became a genuine drama. Tens of millions of our co-citizens and co-patriots found themselves outside Russian territory. Moreover, the epidemic of disintegration infected Russia itself. What does he mean by that? Well, what started infiltrating Russia after the fall of communism? Democracy. You know? He, he's considering that an epidemic of disintegration that infected Russia. Uh, Putin said on Friday he would reverse the collapse of the Soviet Union if he had a chance to alter modern Russian history. And that's exactly what he's trying to do. He's trying to reverse history and bring the Soviet Union back to what he considers its glory days, okay? So this is leading us up. So those events, when you, when you hear things regarding the Soviet Union, um, you know, they'll push into Ukraine, they'll push into Turkey, they'll push into the Middle East. Uh, we read in Scripture that Egypt will fall, but we also read in Scripture that at the time of the end, Egypt will be saved but by God. Um, so we, Revelation 16 now takes us to the battle of, of Armageddon. Um, and we're told in verse 14, and, and this is something, if you have your Bibles, and you, if you're not already there, um, you may want to look this up. So Revelation 16 speaks of that, that great day of God Almighty, we read in verse 14. So verse 14 tells us, brothers and sisters, that spirits of devils working working miracles which go forth in the kings of the earth. So there'll, there'll be this, the, this agitating spirit that will, will affect the nations, that will affect Russia and all its co-conspirators on that great day of the Lord. And we're told at that time when this happens, um, Jesus will come as a thief in the night. Um, those who are responsible uh, will be resurrected. Um, and then there'll be judgment of the responsible, the, responsible the, the sheep and the goats of Matthew chapter 25. And it's clear in verse 16, you know, it says he gathers them together. It's God who's gathering all these nations together for this final day of this great day of the Lord and this day of judgment. And they'll, they'll come to a place called Armageddon. And this word Armageddon, um, means a heap of sheaves in a valley of judgment. And in Joel 3, it describes the valley of Jehoshaphat, uh, which is just outside of Jerusalem. So these nations are going to be gathered in the valley of God's judgment outside of Jerusalem for this, this final confrontation between God and the kingdoms of men. Let's go to Zechariah. I'm going to turn up Zechariah chapter 14. And... It appears, brothers and sisters, that for a while it, it's going to look bleak um, as, as the powers of man seem to be holding a foothold and being triumphant uh, over Israel and, and the people of God. But this is what Zechariah 14 tells us. Zechariah 14, we're going to look at verse 2. Well, verse 1. The day of the Lord cometh, thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken and the ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity. Okay? So Jerusalem will be taken in this battle. And then the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet, Jesus' feet, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, 
which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. All right. And again, mountains representing nations. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel, and ye shall flee. Um, and it goes on and on. So Jesus will intervene. Uh, the nations will be defeated. And in Daniel 2, when it, when it, in verse 35, when it speaks of the crumbling of the image being as the, the chaff of the summer threshing floor blown away and to be found no more will be those who will rebel against God at the Battle of Armageddon. And at Christ and following his return, and just for time, we, we won't go into a lot of these, but it's stuff we know. Israel will be converted when it speaks about their hearts. You know, the heart of Israel will be mended, all right, and they will cleave to their Messiah. Uh, the nations will receive an ultimatum for Jesus to submit to his rule as God's representative, and many nations refuse will be destroyed. Some will join. It seems Egypt will be one of those. Uh, the power and kingdom of Christ will extend throughout the earth with Jerusalem as its world capital. Okay. Um, we, now we get into the, the thousand-year reign where sin will, will be reduced but not eliminated. So that, during those thousand years, there still will be sin because sin is so prevalent it's going to take that long to, to reduce it, to break its its hold over mankind. Um, so we have this thousand year period of, of blessings, peace, and fruitfulness. But once again, uh, we'll, we'll see a remnant of mankind where sin will try one more time to take a foothold um, against Jesus and his reign. Um, and we know the final outcome of that. Uh, God will, will destroy those nations. Uh, there'll be another resurrection. Um, the judgment of the righteous to eternal life, and sin and death will be no more upon the earth. So we have this great day of the Lord and then the thousand-year reign. And a verse here from Ezekiel 38, uh, 23, sums up why all this needs to happen. I will show my greatness, God speaking through Ezekiel, in my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations then they will know that I am the Lord. Something that they forgot so long ago uh, will come back in, in, in time at God's, God's day because God's in control of all things and the nations will be gathered and Christ will start his reign upon the earth. And finally, we'll see the accomplishment of God all in all, 1 Corinthians 15, and... Numbers 14, 21, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Um, just as he wanted at the beginning of time through the dominion mandate, when he told man, you'll have dominion over all things under my control and you'll, you'll spread my glory throughout the world. So that's why the earth was created for mankind and to, to, to spread the glory of God. And that's finally going to be accomplished. Um, after this time, uh, for he formed the earth to be inhabited, verse from Isaiah 45, 18. Um, so it, it's out there. It, it really is a time of, of, of fear for a lot of people, and there are a lot of things going on. I actually have, th there are people that won't watch news anymore because they get so depressed over it, watching the things that happen in, our, in the world today. And I, I don't watch much news anymore. I mean, I, some, you know, if, I might catch a little of it, but, you know, it is. It really is. And something came out today about, um, and I'm involved with the food industry, so I know a little bit about this. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that the food you buy today, the packages are a lot smaller than they used to be. But you're paying a lot more for it than you did. And there's a new term that came out for it. I wish I could remember it, but I can't. Uh, oh, who said that? Yeah, I heard it this morning. And I started laughing, and I said, you know, this has been going on. And then, of course, they'll say, well, you know, the, the vendors, the companies are doing this to adjust for their cost and everything else. But 
Being in the business, I know that if you do a pack change on an item, um, let's say one of the things I, I sell, I, I sell Purdue chicken nuggets, okay? And at one point they went, let's say from a 12 ounce to a 10 ounce, but the cost didn't change. And they'd always tell the customers, well, when things are better and we, we get more raw materials and we'll drop our costs so that you can, and, you know, it doesn't happen. Usually when they get in at a 10 ounce, the cost of a 12, it stays that way. <laughs> it doesn't change unless the vendor really pushes hard and threatens to kick them out over it. But it doesn't change. They usually don't offer that on their own. So I get off course. Um, but one thing, you know, the great hope and the comfort we all should have with all this going on is this, this day is coming. It may be in our lifetime, it may not. God knows the times and the seasons. But we're comforted by this, whether we're here or not, that we'll be resurrected and that we'll join our Savior in the kingdom, God's kingdom that will never end.